So first of all, let me welcome you. Nice to see you. It's a rare and special occasion when people are able to travel from a different country and uh, come together on time, safe, uh, not too many obstructions. So that's your merits, your good karma. Those of you who I know, some of you I haven't seen here for some years. We had the COVID phenomenon. And uh, but, so it's nice that we can come together again. And there are some new people also, meeting for the first time. Uh, happy to welcome you, welcome to Anandagiri Forest Monastery. I was just reflecting a little earlier about what you are all doing and uh, rejoicing. And the expression of faith and the expression of generosity and the expression of effort, making the effort to do these things is all uh, very skillful and it will have very good implications, some of which that you have not even imagined. So, so many of you will have got, very early, got up very early this morning, I'm sure. Some of you started traveling yesterday, some of you started traveling the day before, some of you slept in the airport, and so people have been going against the, the desire for the attachment to being comfortable and uh, giving up a little bit of sleep, giving up a little bit of comfort, being willing to practice with some discomfort and yet with a joyful mind. And this is uh, lowing, laying the foundation, laying the causes for the renunciation barami that you need, that we all need to actually realize Dhamma. So when I think, for example, of my own life, and I decided to do a 10-day retreat at the age of 21, before I had even studied Buddhism. So where does that come from? A willingness to sit for 12 hours a day for 10 days without having even studied Buddhism. There's, I believe, some causes so on in the past where the heart has a very sincere interest, a very sincere aspiration, and it is literally willing to take those leaps of faith. And these leaps of faith are necessary. When I, again, after doing the 10-day retreat, I found it very beneficial, changed my life. I heard the teachings on the Four Noble Truths the first time, they made sense, and they were incredibly helpful. And then within 18 months, I was traveling to Thailand. First country that I ever visited outside of Australia. I didn't have a tour guide. I didn't have a travel agent. I just packed my backpack. I went with my best friend and uh, spent nine months. Again, where does that come from? That willingness to leave your home. That willingness to, if you're not satisfied with your situation, the courage, the determination to try to find something better. I believe this has to have past causes. And, uh, and, and I believe what you're doing now is, is sowing those qualities, is establishing those kind of causes in your own hearts. There's these examples of, uh, I think it was King Pasenadi, when he heard uh, King Bimbisara, or maybe in Anattapindika, I think it was Anattapindika, the millionaire from the Savati area, when he heard the word Buddha from uh, King Bimbisara, he said, did you say Buddha? Yes, I said, but did you say Buddha? He said, did you say Buddha? Yes, I said Buddha. And he, his something in him already knows that word and is very excited and uh, ends up being a tremendous support to Lord Buddha, obviously. But these affinities, these karmic connections that we establish, this willingness to make significant effort, it's uh, very valuable. 
and it manifests in my in the example of my brother's life. So, uh, venerable from Kazakhstan originally, Panyasiri, for willing this willingness to. The venerable grew up in Kazakhstan when it was a communist country. Moved to Russia, learned Russian. Later moved to Cyprus, became an accountant. Later moved to Australia, became a bhikkhu. Lived with Ajahn Kalyana for nine years. And again, there's still that sense of wanting to deepen practice, wanting to keep being courageous, establish deeper levels of peace and insight, well-being. So, as someone almost 50 deciding to come and live in Thailand, that kind of commitment, that kind of courageous uh, temperament, character, is a uh, venerable Tissero. Did many Vipassana meditation courses, originally from Alabama, and uh, eventually found his way to a Bayagiri. Similar story, spending about seven years there, now coming to Asia. This is going forth from the home into a completely new community, a completely new family, getting comfortable there and doing it again. Another country, another community, another family. There's another bhikkhu, he has a sore throat tonight, he couldn't join us. Then it was Sampano. He was uh, also from a Bayagiri. He met the Korean Buddhism when he was a university student in America. And so he went to live in Korea for six years. If you're still here in a couple of days, you may be able to hear him recite the Prajnaparamita Sutta in Korean. He has a very beautiful rendition of the Prajnaparamita Sutta. And similarly, went back to America, lived at Abhayagiri, now, six, seven years later, coming to Thailand. What, what's the point of this? The, the thing I want you to consider is when Lord Buddha talks about Nibbana, he talks about the other shore. And he originally, as the legend goes, after his enlightenment, it said the Lord Buddha was reluctant to teach because he saw that most beings were very committed to self-view, to being a self in a world with self and others, and that what he had penetrated, deeply understood the truth of not-self, he thought, they're just not going to get it. And it's going to be exhausting, frustrating for him to try to teach it, because it is a subtle thing to understand for a world completely committed to self. When you think of the religions that were in the time of Lord Buddha, the what we later call Hinduism, those uh, various Vedas and various deity practices, but in, in general, with theistic religions, people are trying to get their self to go and live with a bigger self, an ultimate self, a pure self. They're trying to understand, they're trying to realize Atman. And Lord Buddha is teaching us Anatman, not self, something, all of those practices, all of these theistic religions that believe in a creator God, that uh, we can go and live in, live in heaven with God. It is true to some degree there are deities that we can go and live with in heaven if we have the requisite levels of merit. But the, what Lord Buddha realized from his uh, divine eye and his capacity to review samsara and see its nature is that even that is impermanent. If you get born as a deva and you get born in the presence of a deity that you love, for, for the Hindus that could be Krishna, Rama, Ganesha, for the Christians and maybe Jesus Christ. But according to what Lord Buddha saw, it was uh, an impermanent state. The beings in the heavens merit runs out and they have to come back down to this life or even a lower life. There's one sutta that says, the uh, it's very good. There's one sutta that says many devas fall from heaven and go to hell from that state. Because what happens is, in a heavenly state, when they're experiencing mostly pleasure, at the time of death, that's when their good karma is starting to wear out. 
they'll experience pain in their body, a bad smell, their jewels fade in luster, their celestial silks become dull, their friends abandon them because all of the devas in the sensual heaven realms are attached to beauty and pleasure. So they see that their friend is no longer beautiful, is no longer pleasant to be with them, they smell bad, they look bad, they look sad, they all abandon them. And not surprisingly, the deva feels sad. Oh, my friends have abandoned me, my jewels have faded, my silks have faded, I've got pain in my body, I smell bad. Many devas go from that state to a hell state. There is a sutta that explains that. So the bodhisattva saw that samsara is a dangerous place. And then when Siddhartha was looking at his wife and looking at his child and decided to leave the palace, it was because he wanted to real. he could see that even though they were young and beautiful and healthy, he could see that old age sickness and death was coming. And he wanted to find a way out, an escape for himself, for his wife, for his son, for all beings. And so, but where does that come from? That sense of being willing to give up a comfortable home, a beautiful wife, a, a love, was well loved by his friends and family. And then that determination when he practiced the austerities, eating just a half a palm of rice for six years, and uh, it said that his belly skin touched his back skin. During that time, first of all, the Bodhisattva mastered the jhanas. And he, he, most of us, if we had those states, if we experienced those states, we'd be completely deluded by them. They're so radiant, they're so beautiful, they're so boundless. If you could do that because of the self-view and because of vanity, you would think you were pretty wonderful and pretty special because you've got this incredible radiant mind. And then many such beings get born as Brahma Devas after that in the Brahma realms. The Bodhisattva, with his incredible mindfulness, was able to see that those states arise, stay for some time and cease, they degenerate. The first jhana up to the eighth jhana, they have to incline the mind to enter the jhana, it stays there for some time, it comes out, no matter how radiant, blissful, spacious, incredible, awesome, it comes back to the ordinary state. So the Bodhisattva was able to see this, even these most amazing samadhi states are subject to death, essentially, arising, saying for some time and ceasing. That's when he decided to practice the austerities, to, to see if patient endurance, the extreme of patient endurance would crack the code, would open the trap door. And uh, he found that it didn't. And it's quite amazing, isn't it, that you could do that for six years and basically fail. So, oh well, that didn't work. And he has a memory and an insight, perhaps practicing some samadhi combined with directed thought and taking care of the body enough to do that, perhaps that might work and he had the insight that will work. He allowed himself to take a meal, the sweet milk rice, take a bath, accepted the eight bundles of kusa grass and sat under the Bodhi tree. But that same spirit, okay, I'm, I'm leaving the palace. Okay, I'm going to try the first four jhanas. Well, that's not working. Okay, I'm going to try the, f the next two arupa jhanas. Okay, they're great, but it's not working. I'm going to try the final two arupa jhanas. Wonderful, but not working. I'm going to try austerity. Ouch, not working. Okay, I'm going to try the middle way. And it worked. But you just see this theme, this theme again and again. The courage, the resolution, the determination. The leaving the palace, the leaving that community, leaving of another community. When he gave up the practice of austerities, his friends said not nice things about him. They said Siddhartha is reverting to luxury. Can you imagine taking one bowl of sweet rice after six years and your friends say he's reverting to luxury, he's lost the plot. And, uh, this phrase, a leader in backsliding, <laughs> returning to the luxurious life. And uh, so when the Bodhisattva is striving under the Bodhi tree, having had a correct insight about the correct way to practice, he didn't have a single friend saying, that's right Bodhisattva, you're onto it now, 
He had to do it alone. And so the point I'm making is that particular quality of courage, the spiritual warrior, the person who is determined to overcome, to uproot the powers of ignorance, greed and hatred, delusion. This is what you're cultivating. When you have enough faith to get up early, to get the time off work, relinquish some of your salary, make a donation, relinquish some of your savings, give up some of your time, put up with the discomfort, express your faith, then this is exactly the spiritual wealth, the spiritual qualities that you're cultivating, so that possibly later in this life and also in your future lives, you'll hear, oh, meditation retreat, there'll be that feeling of, I want to do it. Great master in that monastery, there'll be that feeling of, I want to go and pay respects. Very, very useful, very, very wonderful. And I meet many people in Thailand who have great faith, but uh, they've been born in a place with 95% Buddhists, a place that still has Arahants, and I ask them, do you have a daily meditation practice? And most of the Thai people who I meet don't. So it's like probably the, the result of generosity and virtue, but not yet much spiritual cultivation, that many of them don't yet have the inclination to actually do the practice that will liberate them. So they're working on their foundation of dharma, of sila. But for those of you who have the interest in all three, being generous, being ethical, doing your meditation, doing your chanting, the results would be better. Uh, Lumpur Anand says we aspiring for stream entry. If you want stream entry, you act actually have to aspire for arahantship. You have to want to be an arahant. That's what makes it possible to become a stream enterer at the first stage of enlightenment. You have to aim a bit higher. They say, if you aim for the stars, you make it to the moon. It's like, if you want to be a sotapanna, you have to intend to be an arahant. And uh, some of you may want to be Buddhists. Some of you may wish to be great disciples. Um, up to you. But we all do need to do quite a lot of practice. And so, as a result of these kinds of habits, I'm happy to report that Tanajananan did arrive just before I came to lead the puja. So now we have a very well-practiced senior monk who's going to be the well-practiced disciple of Lumpur Cha, who's going to be the head of the Sangha when we offer the Katina, when you join together in offering the Katina. This is a result of your merit, you see. When you're willing to make some sacrifices, when you're willing to make the effort, when you're willing to travel and you're willing to go with a heart of faith, very worthy objects worthy of expressing your faith are there for you to pay respects to. This is a result of your merit. And when you, when you do this, there's going to be more arahants popping up on your screen in the future as well. Which would be a very good thing, wouldn't it? So I'm happy. I rejoice in your merits. I rejoice in your faith. I rejoice in your effort. And something important that we do have to do, of course, is, uh, I believe, the most important effort that we can make is the consistency. We have to be consistent in our practice. This quality of mindfulness that, when cultivated, made much of, leads to the deathless and merges in the deathless. For it to do that, Lord Buddha says that phrase, right? When cultivated, when made much of, we have to be really sincere and determined in cultivating and maintaining and sustaining our mindfulness. So it really can be the case that we take one step forward and one step back. And then we might be making auspicious karmic connections, but we're not yet going forward. And in this lifetime, when you've met the correct teachings of the Buddha, the disciples of Lumpur Man, then you really do want to take a few steps forward. You don't want to go one step forward, one step back. So when you come to these occasions and if you feel inspired, perhaps you're paying respects at the Chedi, perhaps you're listening to a Dhamma talk, there's moments where you have higher levels of inspiration, deeper level of commitment, conviction. That ideally has to manifest in the future as a commitment to a daily practice. And we have to be determined with that. One thing that Lumpur Biak says is that, suppose at the end of the day you haven't meditated. Most people would feel that to sit there slumped over dribbling wouldn't be of any value. Lumpur Biak says, you should do it, even if you're sitting there dribbling. 
because the next night you probably won't be. If you're establishing and maintaining that habit, you are putting forth an effort. You are cultivating the character, the habit, the tendencies of the spiritual practitioner that will liberate you. But we do have to be determined. I, I often recommend that people do it first thing in the morning, get to bed early enough, get up a bit earlier, don't look at your portable device, put it on flight mode, you're going on an inner journey, you're cultivating your inner qualities, establish some quality, clarity, the quality of clarity before you engage with the rest of your day. And set the determination to bring that clarity into your day. And many Thai people I ask, do you have a daily meditation practice? And they do a few minutes before sleeping. And so Lord Buddha says in the Dhammapada, the mind is the forerunner, the mind becomes like what it attends to. And so the problem with leaving your meditation to the very end of the day is that you've been attending to all sorts of other things. And then you're leaving it to last. And the Lord Buddha did not say, mind is the afterrunner. He said it is the forerunner. He didn't, if it's the most important thing, having some clarity, you know, I was talking with William earlier this morning, that sense of, a lot of us don't even really know what the content of our mind is. And when we begin to do a daily meditation practice, it can actually be humiliating. We don't, we can, we can be quite judgmental of people who we think are evil in the news. Oh, they're evil. Oh, that's really bad. Oh, that's horrible. And then you come and you meditate and you say, oh, there's a really evil thought, there's a horrible thought, there's that nasty thought, and you realize, actually, it's inside too. Lumpo Anand says, if we still have the seeds of Kilesa, if we haven't uprooted them, there is nothing that we cannot do. So any evil, horrible, awful thing you see outside, you're still capable of doing it if you haven't uprooted the seeds of greed, hatred, and delusion. It, and it depends on what kind of nutriment, what kind of fertilizers those seeds meet. If somebody hurts you enough and repeatedly, you might develop a terrible grudge. You might develop an a aspiration to take your revenge. You might plot to do horrible things to them because they hurt you so bad. And so this is why we need to establish the clarity first thing in the morning is that we need to have a look, who are these, what are these qualities in my mind? And uh, the wonderful thing about mindfulness, presence of mind, clarity, truth discerning awareness, is it has a sense for the wholesome, the unwholesome, and the neutral. It's just this kind of gut sense of, I shouldn't trust that mind state. Or this mind state is one that I can trust, or that mind state is one that I shouldn't trust. And if we, if we have our daily meditation practice and we set that determination to establish clarity and to bring that clarity into our life, we will see our thoughts more clearly. It's like a pond that has a lot of ripples. You can't quite see what's in there. But if that pond settles down and becomes clear, you can see what creatures are in there and you can see what's reflecting. It's like a mirror. And we need that. We need our own mind to be a mirror. How we need to have that clarity we need to be truthful. How much is the mind still affected by the hindrance and the kilesas? And it, like I said, it can be initially humiliating. But that is uh, valuable because humiliation can become humility. And I, I have a strong belief that a healthy level of humility has a very strong link to a healthy level of confidence. If you know where you're at, if you know what good qualities you have and what bad qualities you have, then you can be confident about the good qualities you have. You can be confident about the goodness that you do have, and you can build upon it. So don't be scared of humility. And uh, we, when we're truthful about where we're at, most of us will make more effort to better ourselves. And then we really have something to feel some, some joy about, some goodness that we've cultivated. So, I rejoice in your expression of faith, in your expression of energy, and uh, then encourage you to keep cultivating the mindfulness. Then what happens is when we are consistent with our mindfulness, there's going to be more and more periods of peacefulness. This foundation of dana, the generosity, the ethical precepts, the strong faith, putting effort into our practice, being consistent with our mindfulness. In the beginning, that might be if you're sitting for half an hour, five minutes of some peace. Still a lot of thinking, still some drowsiness, but there's that five minutes of peacefulness. After that five minutes of peacefulness is that you really notice that sense of 
freshness, of joy, of tranquility, of well-being. And then we get some inspiration from that. We should get inspiration from that because that's actually much closer to what the nature of the mind is than the dark qualities that keep invading it. And if we, then we get inspired to do a bit more, okay, I'm going to sit for 40 minutes. Those periods of five minutes of meditation may become, of peacefulness, may become 10 minutes of peacefulness, 15 minutes of peacefulness. And that peacefulness gets deeper. And then, then you'll notice with even more awareness, oh, this peacefulness is really wonderful. This peacefulness is uh, really valuable. Lord Buddha says about peace, peacefulness is the highest happiness. We don't know that yet until we've experienced it. The, the, mind wants, want, the mind is always being deluded, thinking, when I get that, I'll be happy. When I get this, I'll be happy. When I get that, I'll be happy. I was talking to a man once that really wanted a Mercedes-Benz, and he got his Mercedes-Benz. And he told me, in the experience of having a Mercedes-Benz, he had two happy days. The day that he got it, and the day that he sold it. <laughs> because in between, he was worried about it getting scratched. He had to take it for the checkup. If he had to change a spare part, it took a long time. Everything cost a lot of money. And it's like, he thought he'd have a lot of happiness when he got his Mercedes-Benz. He had his Mercedes-Benz, he worried about it. And everything was harder if he just got a Toyota. <laughs> it would have been a lot easier. And so I always like it when you hear these stories from people. Oh, that's really interesting. Because that person at least had the truthfulness and the awareness to notice what was his experience of the Mercedes-Benz. And... Uh, so, samadhi, collectedness, peacefulness, a sense of glimpsing your true nature or your something closer to your true nature. This gives you self-respect. When you see, oh look, my true nature is pure, peaceful, clarity that understands emptiness. Emptiness of permanence, emptiness of self. So that foundation of samadhi is when the insight happens, when you have consistent mindfulness, more truth discerning awareness, some stability of mind, then you begin to really notice these three characteristics, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness. You may glimpse, not self. Many people have deeper insights when they do retreats. Seven days, eight, nine, ten days. In a couple of days we'll be having a retreat here. Some of you are attending. That's the time when uh, the consistency of the mindfulness, the frequency of the collectiveness becomes more powerful. And then the depth of the insight, the vipassana insight, seeing things according to these three characteristics. What happens when that occurs is that the deluded habit of perceiving the body and the thoughts and the mind as a self will disappear for some time. And then you will glimpse or experience an even deeper peacefulness than samadhi. And it's one of those things, you can't really describe it other than a complete absence of every type of suffering. Sometimes we don't even know what kind of subtle suffering is affecting the mind. But if you have an experience when the sense of self falls away from the mind for a period of time, there's nothing there that can actually suffer. And then you will know, oh wow, it's possible for this body-mind phenomenon to experience that much peace, wow. And Tanajana Nan often says, when you've really glimpsed the ultimate nature, when you've really seen what a peaceful mind is like, you wouldn't swap it for a mountain of gold. That's how deeply you recognize the value of it. As Lord Buddha says, peacefulness is the highest happiness. So, we have to do enough practice to actually experience it. And then we won't have any doubts about it. And I believe that you will have the potential to do that because you've demonstrated your faith and your energy. You have made your commitment to cultivating mindfulness, doing retreats, etc. You can cultivate the collectedness, some samadhi, and then uh, you will begin to have insights. Maybe you already have had some. But whatever good spiritual qualities are functioning in your mind, I rejoice in them. I rejoice, rejoice in your dharma, your ethics, your mental cultivation. And I hope that uh, in visiting Anandagiri on this occasion, you will multiply your merits manifold. I sometimes tell people that I like to count my merits in mountains. I like to make mountains of merit. If you look to the side of you over there, you'll see there's 4,000 yellow marigolds. 
that we're going to be decorating the chedi with. It's like, if you're going to do something, do it properly. You want a few flowers? No. You want a few thousand flowers. And when, when we're monks, you know, we start to count our meditation hours in thousands and tens of thousands. That's the real deal. So anyway, I rejoice in your goodness. May your goodness multiply and may your goodness speed you to the other shore of Nibbana. I offer this for your reflection. I hope something I said was helpful. <laughs>